In 2 Corinthians, turn there, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 14. As superheroes are the replacement Christ. Uh, that's what they're, they're designed to be, their replacement gods. They want to replace God in your life. They want to replace, it's not a new plan. It's the same old plan that it's always been. Uh, just repackaged for every, every generation. Just repackaged. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse number 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose ends shall be according to their works. Superheroes have captivated much of the entertainment industry. It is a multi-billion dollar industry today. Uh, just some of the top movies, the grossing movies uh, here are in half a billion dollars in, in money that has been brought in. There's, there's a lot of money in that. They understand that it markets a wide range of people. Not just children go see it, but adults go see it. But you think about the children that go see some of these movies like X-Men and some of the others. Some of these ladies that are dressed the way they're dressed are very provocative, very wickedly dressed. Uh, and, and they expose a lot to people J- just, just by those things. Uh, no child or, or man should see that. A man's not to look upon things that aren't his uh, in that way. But these superheroes, this industry, whether it be movies or cartoons, is, is a multi-billion dollar business. It's a lot of money. It's big money. And uh, let's look at, we're going to look at these superheroes and see, are they biblically acceptable with God? Does God like these? Are they new or are they old ones? repackaged are they the same old stories just repackaged and given new names i think you might be shocked when you find out that many of these are nothing more than the gods of old that were talked about from old they're not really new they've just been given they've just been given new names in a new generation but they're the same old ones you know the two latest batman movies alone had grossed half a billion dollars apiece the Marvel X-Men movies and others grossed one quarter of a billion dollars apiece. It's a huge industry. That superhero mania has taken over. But let's look at the history first of it, shall we? We'll look at the history of the superhero industry. Oh, how did it get so popular? Well, before the 1930s, kids would mostly play outside. Not every house had a TV, and children didn't want didn't have superhero comic books. Most kids just played outside. They did normal things that kids do. They learned to work. They learned to be be productive. They learned to interact with people. That's what they did back then. Now, some or, or back in the 30s, uh, things started to change. These comic books, the dawn of the Second World War, brought a lot of fear and anxiety to the world. And comic book superheroes brought some comfort to that. It brought some entertainment to that. See, there was a fear and anxiety that there, the world was going to be destroyed, basically. And uh, so they were a means of comfort and escape. Instead of a reality of the Word of God and faith in God, what was used to reach the masses was comic books and superheroes. You know, a superhero would rise up. Superman was the most popular one, and he came out... Out and he didn't, he didn't fight aliens or others with magic powers. He fought people like Adolf Hitler. He fought people like, uh, uh, Mussolini. He fought people like terrorists, and, or not terrorists, but, but, uh, um, different armies of the world and, and extortioners and people like that that were the bad people of the world. He fought them. He fought people that were feared the most, the gangsters, the fascists, the politicians. Probably should be fighting those now. <laughs> but uh, anyway, after Pearl Harbor took place, superheroes became the literal mascot of the war movement. They they made they they showed uh, they would show Superman on the cover of of uh, 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 grabbing Adolf Hitler and flying him to jail. They would show him being victorious over him. Comic books became a, a million dollar industry. And were a must for U.S. soldiers that were in the war. So all the soldiers, would they would send them comic books and they would read those comic books. Much like in Bible times, the only time Israel ever called on God or the only, was when they were about to be destroyed. The same thing was this, that they, they, would, they would use things to escape reality, but not call on God. So comic books were used as that escape of reality. 
Batman soared in popularity in the 1980s when the drug war was raging. See, comic books went through phases. Superheroes went through phases. When times were good, like in the Clinton era, when prosperity was high, there was a strong decline in comic books and superheroes. Why? Well, because everything was going good, so nobody really needed superheroes or comic books. or It wasn't that big of a deal. But in the 1980s, when the drug wars were going on, you know, the government invented the war on drugs, and the government made the drug cartel. Some of you might get that in a second. But uh, when they created this whole war, and they made it out of thin air, kind of like the war on terror. Oops. Um, kind of like that one. They just made it up. <laughs> How do you have a war on drugs? How do you have a war on terror? I thought you had a war with someone. Hmm. Okay. See, see how that works. Well, then the comic book industry said, "Well, hey, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta." Have. So Batman went around battling drug dealers and killing bankers, or I mean, killing uh, corrupt bankers and corrupt drug dealers and guys like Lee and uh, and. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I'll edit that out. But <laughs> Corrupt bankers, that is. Anyway, so but, but Batman went around uh, killing those and taking care of those. The comic book makers, they responded to the newspaper headlines, and they wrote comics that reflected the war on drugs and the, and the different wars that took place. Well, then, again, with the Clinton era, everything kind of just went quiet. But then, when 9-11 took place, guess what? Everything, when there was a war on terror, when uh, five guys that were hanging out in Minnesota and all over the country decided they were going to fly airplanes into buildings, and they flew them into buildings, I guess, and there were people on them, I guess, and, and they, they, they flew them in there, and then the building flattened and came down, and so did Building 7, which had to be from a comic book because nothing ever touched it. But anyway, so that one fell down too, and, and then we have uh, the rise of comic book heroes. Then you had to have superheroes that went in and and fought the terrorists, I guess. And uh, the, the, the real terrorists, sort of. But anyway, so that's what they did, and, and that's when the superhero comic books took off again. That's when you see the Marvel comics. That's when you see the, uh, the, the rise of, like, the X-Men and Spider-Man. And everything. Remember that? After 2000, that's when all that stuff started again. That's when the rise in popularity, the Incredible Hulks and all those other things that, that, uh, that Superman movies and all those other things that came about why? Because there was a need there, there was anxiety, so they said we can feed this anxiety by letting people just get distracted by comic books and it'll take care of a lot of their fears. So the comic books responded and Spider-Man and all these others rolled out to, to save the world from the corrupt terrorists that hang out in caves with no cell phone coverage. And... That's what they did. So they they hurt the they they were able to battle the evil terrorists and the evil invisible people that were trying to destroy you. Every culture and nationality has had superheroes. Every single one of them. The story of Gilgamesh is the oldest superhero story ever told. And yes, he was a mighty one on the earth. He was a Gabor. He was a giant. Gilgamesh is Nimrod. Many people believe or Osiris. And Horus, well, Horus is his son, but anyway, um, Isis is, is his wife. But funny, isn't it, when we come to evil, when we, when we start talking about superheroes, when we talk, start talking about spirit world stuff, it always comes back to Babylon. It always comes back to that mystery, Babylon, that history, that Nimrod, the of old. Yet, the old story of Nimrod and Osiris and Gilgamesh. By the way, if you remember, when we were studying Hollywood, uh, which this is all part of, but when we were studying the beginning of Hollywood and the beginning of movies and the first movies and everything else, remember we went back and the first, the oldest story ever told, uh, from that standpoint, that, that was that story that the oldest play ever done was that of Osiris, that of Gilgamesh, Osiris, that Sumerian, uh, the Sumerian text. That's the oldest ever written. The old titans, the giants, the sons of God and the daughters of men. Osiris was in charge of the living and the dead. And he was, he was, he was that Gilgamesh, that old wicked one in the earth. Comics are really found on the old Egyptian 
hieroglyphics, they depict the 20th dynasty's battle of Osiris and his brother, Seth. It's interesting, isn't it? And they had powers to shapeshift and morph and other powers as well. You can see on the hieroglyphics on the caves the different shapes and the different figures that they come in that they were able to do that. You know, kind of like those comic books that you see where all these these movies that you see where they shapeshift and they morph and they do all those other things. Yeah, that's not old. That's been around ever since Osiris. That's been around there. Satan is a shapeshifter, I believe, and uh, does the same thing. So anyway, those things are not new. All of this, all of this is paganism, is rewrapped paganism, is all it is. It's rewrapped spiritism. It's that battle of the ages, that mystery of iniquity versus the mystery of godliness. Osiris is Satan, make no mistake about it, and Egypt still, still wields that influence. In fact, you see it in the Federal Reserve today. When you look on the dollar, don't you see the eye of Horus? I mean, just pull out a dollar. Pull out a few of them if you want. Pull out, a, pull, pull out a dollar and look at it. And what do you have on it? You have the all-seeing eye on the dollar. And below you have Federal Reserve note. Hmm. All the world, right? The all-seeing eye. Has the story ever changed? No, it's the same story. Just repackaged and sold in a different way. It's that mystery religion. It's still intact today. And it's a cultic, all-seeing eye on everything. The Greeks had the same characters. They had Zeus, they had Poseidon, they had Hercules, and they had Hades. The Greek gods fought the Titans. The Titans were around before the gods. But then the gods decided to fight the Titans and destroyed them. Or banished them, actually. We'll talk about that in a minute. That same theme runs through every culture, that a Savior will come that is part God and part man. That a Savior will come. That's what the comic books are all about, that somebody's going to come and save you. A modern movie called The Immortals came out that showed the gods fought the Titans and the gods won, and they they imprisoned the Titans in Tartarus. Wasn't that interesting? Because don't you know where the... Don't you know where the, the fallen angels are, that left the, the ones that left their first estate are? They're in a chamber holding cell in hell. And old Apollyon is down there with them. Apollyon. That's another Greek god, isn't it? A Roman god. Should Christians have something to do with that? Should we be supporting those things? Should we be supporting comic books and superheroes? There, there are some angels that left their first estate that are in that same holding cell. The hero of this story, of, of that of the Titans, is a half-god, half-man named Thesis who will save the world from the wrath of the gods. But that man is not a type of Christ. He's a type of the Antichrist. He's a ruthless warrior that killed people. An idolater that started the worship of Aphrodite. Again, another movie, Clash of the Titans, was about the sons of the Titans, the gods, ending the reign of the Titans. Zeus became god of the heaven. Poseidon became god of the sea. And Hades, tricked by Zeus, became god of the underworld. Have you ever seen Poseidon in modern comic books? Sure you have. He's called Aquaman. He's called Aquaman. That's Poseidon. Think about it. Zeus created man in in Greek mythology. Zeus created man and man's prayers fed the gods or mortality. All of these ancient myths speak of a son coming that will change the world and save humanity. Their goal is to replace the God of the Bible with Satan, the replacement God, the God of this world. By the way, Zeus is known as the prince of the air. Interesting enough, there were altars found to Zeus near Pergamos, where the Bible says Satan's seed is. And the Bible says Antipas, my faithful martyr, was martyred there. Antipas was martyred there because he would not bow down to Zeus. And he would not bow down to the altar that was there. So they had him martyred for that. He was killed for that. 
Zeus is Satan. You see, these comic book themes have tried to replace Christ. All the way through all of these comic book themes, there's a theme that that races through there called the sons of God and the daughters of men. That they would create these godlike people that would come, that would have a lot of power, and they would control. A lot of people think J.R. Tolkien was a Christian. He was a lost Catholic that died and went to hell. Amen. But he did the same thing in that movie, Lord of the Rings. Gandalf the wizard in the Lord of the Rings, who dies helping Frodo, but then resurrects again into a, a white wizard. See? Satanic. Tolkien mixed Christianity with paganism. Same thing C.S. Lewis did, by the way. C.S. Lewis is, was a lost, wicked man, too. His, his, his movie is mixed with paganism, with Christianity. It's a mixture of the two. It's a hybrid worship of the two together. It's not fit for anybody to read. Nobody should have anything to do with C.S. Lewis. It's a bunch of garbage, a bunch of pagan garbage. Now look at the specific superheroes of the day today. Look at look at how they are. Look at their look at their superhero uh, uh the, the modern day ones. Look at the character of Batman. He's a master detective. He has billions of dollars. He's an escape artist. He seems to be a good guy. However, when we see him, he looks like a middle-aged demon. Look at the pictures of the Middle Ages when you go through Dante's Inferno and other things like that. If you look at the pictures of, of devils and demons, Batman looks exactly like those devils. He looks exactly like them. He's got the, the, the horns that stick out like that on the, on the bat, the, the, the ears that stick out like that, and he's got the cape that surrounds him. It's all demonic. Absolutely demonic. The Dark Knight, he's called. Men love darkness rather than light. He was created by an act of murder. The whole theme of Batman is that he is created by an act of murder. He watches his parents die, so then he he decides to give his life to be a, a superhero to fight. And he uses humanism, he uses his mind to battle it all. The storylines in Batman include, though, one of the one of the comics, one of the main comics, Son of the Demon. Sounds good and wholesome, doesn't it? By the way, the Dark Knight series has so many hidden messages and programming in it, it'll make you sick. You adults can go on Alex Jones and look at the Dark Knight and, and, and just Google that and look at the, the encrypted codes and the encrypted language that's in there and the predictive programming that is in there uh, to try to sway a man into doing something. And they've got people that are programmed out there with all this stuff anyway. But but you'll see how closely that's tied up into these shootings that took place this last this last summer. They openly talk about it. I mean, look at the map. Somebody followed that map, and you see the, the names of the cities where those shootings take place, and they're on the map. I mean, nobody's making it up. You can go watch it. You can, you can Google the whole scene. It comes down, and it shows it, that these things took place on these maps. And even if that wasn't the case, should any Christian have anything to do with Batman? What, how Christ-like is, is anything that that, that that show produces or that show does? It's occultic garbage. How about the next one is Wonder Woman? Now, Wonder Woman goes without saying. I mean, I mean, the lady runs around in her underwear, so it can't be. It, it, there's nothing feminine about that. I mean, there's nothing good about that. And I mean, she she runs around with with worse than a bikini. I mean, less than a bikini. And I mean, no no man could think that 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 is proper, or woman could think that that is proper to watch, right? I mean, we understand that, right? There's not. I mean, I hope you understand that. However, I know that some Christians probably don't understand that, or they say they're Christians anyway. But but listen to what the mantra was. Listen to what the the um, what the her creed was, so to speak, from the island that she's from. But maybe some of you don't know who she is. Wonder Woman's actually in the Bible. So I'm going to show you that here in a second that she is actually in the Bible. So we'll turn to the scripture and you can see her. She's in there. But let all who read these words know we are a nation of women dedicated to our sisters, to our gods, and to the peace that is humankind's right. Granted life by Gai, the goddesses, and the souls of women past, we have been gifted with the mission to unite the people of our world with love and compassion. 
Man has corrupted many of the laws our God set forth. So in their wisdom, the goddesses did create a race of female warriors dedicated to the ideals of uniting all people, all sexes, all races, and creeds. No longer will man rule alone. For now women stand as an equal to temper his aggression with compassion, lend reason to his rages, and overcome hatred with love. That's enough feminism to make you puke, isn't it, right there? My goodness. We are Amazons. We have come to save mankind. <laughs> Sorry. You can't make this stuff up. It's right there. All right. The creator was William Moulton Marston, a psychologist already famous for inventing the polygraph. Forerunner to the magic lasso, by the way. He invented the polygraph, and then he invented the magic lasso for Wonder Woman. Just throw it around there, and the truth comes out once you get that lasso around. Brother Russ knows. But... uh he struck up on, upon an idea for a new kind of superhero, one who would triumph, not with fists or firepower, but with love. Fine, said Elizabeth, but make her a woman. By the way, he was a polygamist and a feminist. But turn to Acts chapter 19 and you can find Wonder Woman. Acts chapter 19 and verse number 27 you find, So that not only... This, our craft, is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. And when they heard these things, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. There's your Wonder Woman story. That's her name. By the way, that is her name. If you read it, that's her name on her island, on the Amazon island, is Diana. That's her name. She is Diana of the Ephesians. She is found in the Bible. She's that false god. I can't show you a picture of her because it'd be like showing you pornography. So, but you get the point. You know who she is by the name. Now, so you see that, that, that there's nothing new under the sun. They, they're using that same perversion right there to show you. Here it is right here in front of your face. And you don't even notice it. Flash is another superhero who is the same as the Greek god Hermes. Another of the superheroes was uh, another of the superheroes. They're called the New Gods. That's what they're called. Another a writer writes that, that these superheroes are nothing more than the New Gods. She's right. They are not shy about telling you what they are doing. By the way, they just know that most Christians don't care. They know that you don't care. You'll buy it anyway. They're not shy. They're very open about their about what they're doing with these superheroes. Very open. Uh, the Riddler is a picture of Osiris. He's the same as Osiris. How about this one? Catwoman. Catwoman is the goddess Bassus. She's a goddess, goddess Bassus. And uh, the goddess Bassus was usually represented as a woman with the head of a domesticated cat. However, up until 1000 BC, she was portrayed as a lioness. Bassus was the daughter of, of Ra, the sun god. It may have been through him that she acquired her feline characteristics. When Ra destroyed his enemy, Apep, he was usually depicted as a cat. As portrayed as a cat, she was connected with the moon, or was the god of the moon. When shown as a lioness, she is associated with sunlight. Bassus was the goddess of fire, cats, of the home, and pregnant women. The god of pregnant women. Uh-oh. According to one myth, she was the personification of the soul of Isis. You know who Isis is, don't you? Isis is Osiris' wife. As such, her counterpart was, was another god named Sekhmet. But anyway, as you see here, these gods are real gods. This Catwoman and all these other things. And by the way, if you, and I'm not telling you to do this, but in the movie Replacement Gods, they talk about this. If you go to that Batman movie and you see it, they are thumbing through a book. And in that book, is the book of that god, Bass, Bassus. And in that book, they are showing the pictures of all the ones who, who played the cat, or who were the cat woman or the cat god all the way through the centuries. And that some power is unlocked with that. And they're showing you the Egyptian witchcraft right in front of you. They're showing you the god Osiris. They are showing you Horus. They are showing you Isis. They're doing it right in front of you. They're, they're blatant about it. They're not trying to erase it. They just know that most Christians are too busy watching that instead of studying and knowing the truth. They're too entertained. 
And by the way, I mean, look at the the outfits of that Catwoman. All these superheroes are about seducing and wickedness and the way that they're dressed. It's all wicked. It's absolutely wicked. No Christian should be watching that garbage. That Christian's out there watching things like The Hobbit. How does a Christian watch that and, and not be convicted over how wicked that is? It's absolutely wicked. All right, the Dark Knight movies full of tarot cards. Uh, most of those Dark Knight movies you will see on the ground when they throw the when the Joker is throwing those cards. He's not throwing a deck of cards. He's throwing tarot cards, and he throws different images down while he's doing it. Heath Ledger, the man who played the Joker, died during the filming of the next movie, which had the scene of a hangman tarot card, which was the final scene in Dark Knight. The final scene in the Dark Knight was 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 an upside down crucifix of the Joker hanging upside down off of the off of a building where Batman is ready to drop him or whatever. Or he's trying to save him or whatever from dropping him. Um, but anyway, he's he's like this, and the tarot card flips out of that now. In the next movie that he made was not a Batman movie. It was a totally different movie. But in that movie where Heath Ledger was playing, there was that that same tarot card was laid down. That tarot card was called The Fool. Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means to to, uh, a cultist, The Fool? Do you know what that means? It's Jesus. That upside-down cross is Jesus Christ. They are throwing that card out there and flipping that card because they are calling Christ the eternal fool. Because he came and he died for your sins. And, he, and they say that that was a sacrifice to Satan. And they flip that card out there to show that he is the eternal fool. Yeah. Actually, they call him the holy fool. Or the unholy fool, one of the two. But anyway. But that Heath Ledger ended up dying, though, didn't he? I think we know who the fool was. The fool hath said in his heart there is no God. He found out there was one when he overdosed on drugs. You can't play with God. You think we ought to be glorifying these people and calling them heroes? They're not heroes. Do you really think those people are heroes? These superheroes, these people that they're here, no, they're not heroes. They make actors and sports figures out to be heroes. They're not heroes. They're a bunch of wicked paint, painted up Wicked heathens is what they are. They tattoo their bodies all up. They look like a bunch of devils and they run around. They run around and act like the devil themselves. Fornicating with thousands of women. Never staying home with their families. Running around all the time. Making movies that mock God. And you got Christians that are supporting it. Superheroes are nothing but a replacement God. That's all they are. They're pagans. A bunch of wicked pagans. The occult. They call Christ the holy fool. In that movie, the Joker, he plays a type of, they, 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 they try to make him out to actually be a demented type of Christ. Because in that movie, the, in the Dark Knight, in that movie, and I've never seen the movie, I've just, I've watched the, the, the replacement gods that, that breaks it down scene by scene there on, on some of those things. And, and he goes through there and he actually, he, they actually put him in the cell with an insane man. And the insane man was, he actually, the Joker actually heals that insane man. And they ask him how he did it, and the insane man says that he got inside my head and he showed me the light. It's satanic, folks. These superheroes are nothing but satanic. But then again, we can't tell the difference anymore between the saved, the righteous of God, and the unrighteousness of this world. Because God's people have mingled the two together so much. Do you really think that a preacher should actually have to be preaching against superheroes that people can't see the obviousness of it that it's wicked do you see how spiritually blind we are that we haven't that these things are not so easily discerned among god's people today now you have to preach things to bring it to people's remembrance and you have to continue on because we are sinful men but the point is is that when you when you argue against when you argue for something it's just like a perfect example of this just just an absolute perfect example of this. And I, I I just took this guy off of my Facebook page. And the reason I did is because I the guy is supposed to be a saved Christian. But uh, here's a photo right here. Here's a, And he's arguing for this. Here's a photo right here. I want you to look at that. You see that photo? 
Anybody know who that what that looks like? Yeah, you've seen it before. You recognize that, don't you? You recognize that little guy back there? Yoda from Star Wars. You recognize that? So, cuz Yoda's not new. See, Yoda's the god of Freemasonry. And that is not that is Yoda. That is spelled J O T A, not Y O D A. But that is the same that is the same thing that you will find in George Lucas's films. You didn't get to see this in the back of it. This is the same image that you find in George Lucas's films. His name is Yoda. And by the way, in the it, what's Jehovah is and, and, and other names that are used for God. Some people call him Yahweh. Some people pronounce it in a different way. Um, I'm not saying that's that's the right interpretation. But you see that this is Freemasonry. This is him standing in a pentagram. This is the god Yoda. Freemasonry calls Freemasonry calls him that. He is spelled with a J though, and not a Y. Now that doesn't change, and that doesn't change the fact of who he is. He is the same guy. Now George Lucas and artists are better artists today and can draw things with better, and they can do 3D things now. But that is the exact same god. That is the exact same person. Oh, by the way, in the left-hand corner, you see Baphomet. Did you see him up there? He's he's up there. Uh, what's my point? My my point is is that somebody actually argues whether that is that is right or wrong, or that Star Wars is good or bad, or that Star Wars is not bad, that it's okay. Well, listen, yeah, the Freemasons think it's okay too, and the devil laughs about it too, <laughs> because God's people are so swayed so easily all right a man by the name of grant morrison is the writer of the batman series he's he's satanic he admits to putting tarot meanings in the movies and the joker is the fool tarot card the occult calls christ that holy fool then you have the character of thor who was thrown out of the heavens who traded peace for vanity and war you know the god thor he was thrown out of the heavens, and and Zeus threw him out of the heavens, and he went flying down to the earth, and he descended to earth. Who else traded peace for war? Satan. But they make Satan out, or Thor out, to be a hero on earth. He's a god on earth. You're right. He is. Satan is called the god of this world. But they find some virtue in the one that traded peace for war. Do you see how they do that? Do you see how superheroes do that? Okay. They trade they trade peace for war. The only one like that would be would be the devil himself. Don't you hear the hiss of the serpent on these superhero movies? Alan Moore is a superhero writer. He's written many many movies. He wrote he wrote and directed the, the Watchmen, V for Vendetta, From Hell, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, The Mindscape of Alan Moore, Tales of the Black Freighter, Freighter, Hyperspace, Under the Hood, Composing the Beatles Songbook, Lennon and McCartney. Well, that doesn't surprise me any. They had Aleister Crowley on the uh, well, one of them did anyway. Anyway. Um, he also, this man, Alan Moore, also worships a dragon statue called Glycon. He says this. Now remember, he is one of the most revered men in this industry. I decided I was going to become a magician. He turned 40 years old, and he said he decided he was going to turn to become a magician. All of a sudden, the lightning bolt hit. Isn't that weird, that language, the lightning bolt hit? I beheld Satan as lightning. It all got a bit strange, he said. For months after that, I was looking back, probably in some borderline schizophrenic state. I found myself seemingly in conversation with an entity. Its presence that surrounded my head, moving and speaking lucidly to me. I was very spaced out, God-struck. You babble for a while like an idiot. I must have been unbearable for two or three months. I've integrated that into the rest of my life. Grant Morrison, one of the most revered ones, one of the main writers of these Batman and all these other series that are, became very Superman and the others, one of the most popular ones in the last ten years. Grant Morrison is another head writer. He's into chaos magic. 
No one on earth can you learn no one on from no one on earth can you learn more about magic than Grant Morrison had said. Alistair Crowley was one of his favorites. For his 19th birthday, he was given Alistair Crowley's books. He immediately started casting spells. That night. He said that night that he cast a spell. And he had a vision that night. And a lion came to him in that vision. I bet he did. I bet that roaring lion that walketh about seeking whom he may devour did come. And the lion started talking to him and he said he started to get scared and he was, he was asking, he was, he was crying for his mom and dad to help him and for Jesus to help him out of it and everything else. But then after that he said he knew he could cast spells. One fellow writer testifies that he opened the door and asked Grant Morris if he could, if he wanted to drink. He wanted to go for a drink. And he said, no, he was having breakthroughs. He was lying on the floor with a blanket over top of his head, and he was writing. And then all of a sudden, the door shut, boom, without anybody touching it. He testifies in his biography that he came and he broke out in boils and fevers while writing. He said he saw Jesus, and he told him to share the Gnostic light, the Gnostic Jesus. He goes on to say this, I, I hallucinated something that I recognized immediately as Christ. A column of light phased through the door, clear as day, then a powerful sermon seemed to download into my mind. I understood that this power I was facing was some kind of Gnostic Christ, a Christ of the Apocrypha, an almost pagan figure that I'd found at the bottom of the last gasp. Satanic. His greatest feat was a series he wrote, of six billion people following Superman and all the powers following him into the sun to battle the gods that were coming to destroy the earth, or coming to destroy them. Now there will be a battle that all the world will gather. All the world will battle together and will battle the Lord and his Christ. And he will come and destroy them with the brightness of his coming. And he'll come in the end and he'll melt the earth with fervent heat. What he is describing is Satan and the battle of the nations at the, all the way at the end. After Satan is loose for a season and he tempts the nations once more and he gathers all the nations up to war against God and his Christ. Right? Except he was writing a comic book that was going to battle that God that is coming, that will take over. He is writing something against the God of the Bible, where everyone he said has superpowers. All six billion people had superpowers to fight. Let me ask you a question. If they send a mixed message of Christ and the devil, should we support that? Do these mixed messages really help a man come to know Christ as his Savior? Will these mixed messages of superpowers and devilish folklore with the Bible mixed together, will that help a man come to Christ? Will that help him with clarity come to know the Lord Jesus Christ? Or will that just confuse the masses? It's designed to confuse the masses. You see, this is a spiritualism. These guys are witches. They are warlocks. They are, they are spiritual mediums, and they admit to being... You could Google Alan Moore. He admits to being a spiritual medium. He admits to it. They, 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 have no, they make no bones about it. But every time you buy one of their Superman comic books, every time you buy one of their movies, or you, you, you get one of their movies and you, you support them, you are supporting an industry, industry that is anti-Christ. You are supporting an a industry that is replacing Christ with these false gods. Why? Because deceivableness is coming upon all the earth. And the Antichrist, God shall send them strong delusion that they all might be damned that believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. All the world is taken with superheroes. Worldwide, multi-billion dollar, I would dare say a multi-trillion dollar, a trillion dollar industry. Because these movies are making half a billion dollars at a time, worldwide. 
and people are flocking to them. And these are their heroes that they look up to. These are the ones that they look up to and they hold and they revere up. Why? Because they have some kind of magic powers. They have some kind of power that they wield. Some kind of strength. They can fly like that prince of the power of the air. They can do all of these things. And guess what they don't need? They don't need a God in heaven. Because they have powers. They don't need a Savior. They already have one. The God of this world is their Savior. So let me ask you, should our, should our children... Should our adults, you've got adults that, that follow this stuff just as much as children do. I mean, adults are captivated with it today. They are absolutely captivated with, with superheroes today. They're enamored with it. Should these be our heroes? Should these, the demigods, should these, the fallen, the fallen sons of God be our heroes? Should we be supporting them? You want to follow something? Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. I want to show you some people that God put in this this hall of faith here. Some people that we can see. How about your children get to know some of these people? And more importantly, the God that they served. How about this? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. By it he being dead yet speaketh. He, the one that being dead, yet speaketh. Why? Faith in God. Do your children know who that is? All these Christians that are celebrating, that that are, that are, that that go to these churches that are sending them over to see the man of steel, the man of sin this week. How about they get to know this one? Why don't you go into this book and look at Hebrews chapter 11 and look at some of these people? By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He pleased God. You want your son to know people that are, that are false gods, that are antichrist? Or do you want to know about a man that pleased God? But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. How about a man that trusted God and believed him? He couldn't see it. He just believed it. How about your son and daughters and your children know something about them? By faith, Abraham, when he was called to God out of the place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, and heirs with them of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Amen. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. How about your daughters don't get to know Wonder Woman or Diana, the God of the Ephesians, but they get to know the God of the Bible. And they get to know Sarah, a lady that followed God, that believed God. Therefore sprang there even one of him and as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. How about that? You know what? Why don't you model your lives after those that, 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 that understood the book and the faith of the, they had faith of the Son of God. And you know what? They knew they were strangers and pilgrims, so they, weren't, they were only here to please God. And then they'd be gone. Some of you know more about movie characters than you do about the Bible. Than you do about these, you've taught your daughters and your sons more on television screen and on a movie screen than you have 
in the word of God. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had the opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country. You know, that's supposed to be you and I. We're remodeling our lives after the Scriptures. And, and, and these are these are heroes of the faith. These are those that stood by the book. They worship the God of heaven. That's who your children should know about. But now they desire a better country that is a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the parting of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, had hid three months of his parents because they saw him a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? That's right, civil disobedience. They just believed God. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. I wonder if you'd refuse that. You know what that means, don't you? That means that sometimes your family is not going to like your decisions. Sometimes you're not going to be able to identify with them. Sometimes you're going to have to identify with all the time. You're going to have to identify with God. And God's going to cause a division sometimes. Because His Word does. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. How about, is that you? Would you choose rather to suffer the afflictions with the people of God? Now, be it these afflictions are light for us today. But let me ask you a question. Your family wants you to do something that's against your principles and against the book. Are you going to do it? Or are you going to follow God? Are you going to be identified with God or are you going to be identified with the world? You'll be able to stand up and tell your family, no, we don't watch that stuff. It's satanic. It's wicked. It's wrong. And we can prove it. And then watch them defend it. And then you'll know where their heart is. And then you don't have to talk anymore. Because you'll understand where they're really at. Esteeming, listen to this, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. He was more concerned with what God thought than what man thought. I wonder if you and I are. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Do your children know about these people? Do they understand who these people are? Are they looking for some superhero, something with magical powers? How about the ones that had the faith of Christ? And followed him. Through faith he kept the Passover and sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by the dry land with the Egyptians, as saying, as saying to do were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. There's your miracles right there. You don't need some stupid satanic movie. You've got the Word of God you can teach your children about miracles. By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not, when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I say more? What shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak, of Samson, of Japheth, of David, also of Samuel, of the prophets. Isn't it interesting that Barak is mentioned there? You, you don't see the queen of the feminists in there, do you? I say that because they pervert it. Do you don't see you, you know which one's missing? Brother Russ, who's missing? Deborah. They always bring that up, but she doesn't seem to be in the heroes of faith. Now let's not belittling, it's because she wasn't meant to be a leader. Isn't that nice about that King James Bible? It always brings the truth out, doesn't it?
who through faith subdued kingdoms. Listen to this. You want to hear about some heroes? Why? They were heroes because they believed God and they obeyed him. Listen. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promise, promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Hey. And women received their dead raised up uh, to life again. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains, in dens and in caves of the earth. All And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. You want your children to be... You, you, want, you want some heroes? God's the best hero your children will ever have. And you know what? Those that follow Him, that, that, that are found in this book, that believed God, we ought to learn about them. We ought to learn about this book. Your children ought to learn about those heroes. They don't need the secular ones. They don't need the satanic ones. Superheroes are replacement gods. They're replacements for the one true God, the Lord Jesus Christ. They pervert the truth. That's what they're there to do. They're there to send a mixed message, a confusing message, a message after the rudiments of this world and not after Christ, a message with the vain philosophies of men, looking for that humanistic superman that will come when we know that we wait for the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we suffer affliction, if we suffer persecution, by the way, it strikes me as very odd that God's people, we don't suffer much persecution today. Now, I'm glad for that in the case of some types of persecution, but I will say this, the longer you stand for this book, you are going to suffer some persecution. The more you follow this word, you are going to suffer some persecution. That's not always death or pain. That can be other areas. But you are going to suffer for this book if you follow it. But the reason why God's people don't suffer today is because they don't follow the book. Because nobody has a problem with our Christianity. <laughs> and, you should be, and you shall be hated for, by all men for my name's sake. You shall be hated by all men for my name's sake. I wonder if we are. I wonder if what we have, if the world hates us. I preached a message to you, the world hates Christ. But I wonder if the world hates us like they do Christ. I wonder if the world hates our stand as much as, as, much as they hated Christ. Then I have to ask myself, am I following this book like I'm supposed to? Or is the world very chummy with me? Do they get along with me very well? How come it is that, that God's people don't want to rock the boat and so many pastors out there don't want to rock the boat, but the devil's all, all for tipping it right over? He tips it right over. He produces movies that mocks Christ, that shows nudity and fornication, wickedness. He brings it right into your living room. He brings it right into, you bring it right into your living room, but you allow him to bring it right into your living room, or, or Christians allow it to bring them right into their living room to turn that on and to watch that, or over the internet, to watch that filth and that smut and that wickedness, and, and we don't want to rock the boat by saying anything. Why? If they're bold enough to make the movie, if your friends and family are bold enough to ask you to watch it, then why aren't you bold enough to stand up for the book and say, you know what, no. Because as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We're going to stand on the side of this word, of his word. Why can't we be that bold? Why are we, why are we cowering in the corner when they are boldly coming out and proclaiming their faith and what they believe? Hollywood boldly comes out and shows what they believe. They boldly pervert the word of God. They blasphemously pervert it and make movies about it and shove it in your face. But we're going in the closet and the queers are coming out. Why? Why are we so timid to bring the truth? 
Why are we so, why are we so lackadaisical? Why are we so, so laid back about it? Why doesn't the world hate our Christianity? Far too long have we been too worried about intimidating somebody or making somebody feel bad or rocking the bow. When you've got Christians that are professing Christians and some pastors that, are, that, are, that, that, that will get on Facebook and argue for Hollywood. So they are boldly proclaiming their defense of Hollywood while we're boldly proclaiming its wickedness. Do you understand what's wrong with that? Do you see what that means? The complacency and the blindness and, and the spirit, spiritual lethargy that's there? Do you see how sad that is? God's people have no business messing around with these satanic demons, these these super these superheroes, these false gods. We have no business being around any of them or having anything to do with any of them. But we're to abstain from all appearance of evil. And by the way, the Bible's very clear. Turn to Romans chapter 12 and then we'll get out of here. But Ro- Romans chapter 12. Verse number one, I beseech you, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's just, I've preached it to you before, a, a message on that, your reasonable service. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Acceptable. The sacrifice had to be acceptable unto God. Not without, not with blemish, not tainted with the world, not some worldly mix, mix, mixed into it, not some worldly imperfections mixed into it, but wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. Well, what, what is this world? This cosmos, this world system. What is it? It's wickedness. Would you say that superheroes and watching them in comic books and those things, is that of this world or is that of heaven? They're of this world. And be not conformed. Don't be conformed into this world. Don't, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do you think it's the perfect will of God for us to mess around with the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe? Anybody think that? Anybody think that that's the perfect Christian message? That's giving the perfect example of who Christ is? With witchcraft mixed in? How about superheroes? Is that the perfect will of God? Or is that the confirmation of this world? When you are to be transformed from above with a mind that is stayed on the word, that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, for he trusteth in thee. You're not going to have the peace of God when you're messing around with the world. And when you're filling your heart and your head with superheroes that have nothing to do with Christ. They are antichrist.